Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Trinity Lutheran on what will serve as our first of three Fall Stewardship Sundays. The title of our worship is The Christian is Rich. That's our three-week series, that the Christian is rich when they find real wealth in heavenly treasures. The whole point is if we find our real worth in earthly treasures, we lose it all. Eventually we will. But when we find our real wealth in the treasures that God gives, heavenly treasures, we are freed up to do so many wonderful things in this life in the name of our Savior. I'd like to call up Mrs. Debbie Priest this morning to give you a, a little bit of information on some, some programs or emphases that our Board of Stewardship is going to be rolling out to you in the next few weeks. Debbie. Good morning, everybody. Um, Good morning. My husband, Steve, and I have been longtime members of Trinity, and we're also very honored to be uh, part of our stewardship committee. Um, we'd like to invite each and every one of you um, to one of our seminars, Ask a Charitable Giving Expert, tomorrow, Monday afternoon at 4 and then again at 6.30. Our seminar will provide the opportunity to help support our Trinity of tomorrow without writing another check today. We will be providing a great selection of food, and we'd please consider spending time at Trinity versus the debate or Monday night football. <laughs> Our Stewardship Commission has offered other successful seminars, such as Ask an Attorney, which highlighted will and estate planning, as well as through the lens of gratitude, a personal growth seminar. We believe stewardship is about giving and providing generosity with God's gifts. We would like to encourage all of our Trinity members to pray how we all can make a positive difference in growing Trinity's mission and our school for the future. Stewardship has started our very successful po Power of Pocket Change, a generosity giving exercise which challenges us to donate a little more each week. Please consider small pocket change, then small bills, then perhaps larger bills to support causes outside of our congregation. Stewardship will also be supporting our giving trees during the holiday season. Thank you all, and may God richly bless you during the coming week. Go Packers! Had to get it in. Yeah. Just a reminder that that power of pocket change exercise will be going through in the next few weeks, that those are external uh, matters from Trinity, uh, half of that offering will be going to Waukesha Hope Center for helping out the homeless right here in downtown Waukesha. And then the other half of that pocket change offering over the next several weeks will be going to the Wells Mission for the Children, buying Christmas presents for poor children in Mexico this Christmas. With that, our service begins at the top of page 3 in the service folder. Please stand. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of God, our Heavenly Father, to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hand, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and salvation. O oh, come, let us worship him. Let us kneel and bow down before him. Let us confess our sins with penitent hearts, and obtain forgiveness by his infinite grace and mercy. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed the devices and desires of our hearts. We have offended against your holy law. We have done those things which we should not have done, and we have not done those things which we should have done. Have mercy on us, O Lord, Spare us and restore us according to the promises you have declared to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. For his sake, grant that we may live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. 
the Almighty and merciful Lord, has granted us pardon and forgiveness of all our sins, grace for true repentance and amendment of life, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. We continue our worship as we sing the opening hymn, hymn number 477. Please stand. O oh Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O oh God. Praise be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us worship him.
Please be seated. The first lesson appointed for this, the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, is recorded for us in the Old Testament book of the prophet Amos, reading from chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. In our reading, the prophet gives a warning to those who trample on the needy. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation, to whom the people of Israel come. Go to Kelna and look at it. Go from there to the great Hamath, and then go down to Gath and Philistia. Are you better than those kingdoms? Was their land larger than yours? You put off the evil day and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds and laid with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fatted calves. You strum away on heart your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions. But you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. The word of the Lord. We continue our worship as we sing the psalm of the day, Psalm 146. It's printed out for you as we sing together the anthem on page 7.
The second reading appointed for today is recorded for us in the New Testament book of 1 Timothy, reading from chapter 6, beginning at verse 6. In our reading, St. Paul uncovers for us the secret of being happy, recognizing whereof all of our blessings have come from, not from our hand, but from God in heaven, and also the difference between contentment and the love of money. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this commandment without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for today is recorded for us in the Gospel of Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 41. This will also serve as the basis for Pastor Christie's sermon you'll be hearing in just a few moments. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. We say together the seasonal response. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. You may be seated. We continue our service with the double baptism. What you're about to see is a miracle, more than just water being placed on two girls' heads, but Jesus washing all of their sins away in holy baptism and receiving them into his kingdom. I now invite the congregation to open to page 13 in the front part of your red hymnals and we'll follow the responses there. Page 13, as we follow the order of holy baptism. Page 13. In obedience to the command of our Lord and trusting in his promise, you have brought these girls to be baptized. Jesus told us, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. It is in baptism that God grants the new life of forgiveness, joy, and peace to little children. By the power of God's word, this gracious water of life washes away sin delivers from death and the devil, 
and gives eternal salvation to all who believe. Receive the sign of the cross on the head and on the heart to mark you as redeemed daughters of Christ. Kimura Seegerson Hutter, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now Lydia, Lydia Seegerson Hutter, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has forgiven you all your sins. By your baptism, girls, you are now born again and made dear children of your Father in heaven. May God strengthen you to live in your baptismal grace all the days of your lives. Peace be with you. At this time, I'd ask the congregation, please stand. Our Lord commands that we teach his precious truths to all who are baptized. Christian love urges all of us, especially parents and sponsors, to assist in whatever manner possible, so that Lydia and Kimura may remain children of God until death. If you are all willing to carry out this important responsibility, then answer together, yes, as God gives me strength. Yes, as God gives me strength. Let us pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of baptism by which you offer and grant the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Help us to regard our own baptism as the robe of righteousness we are to wear all the days of our life. Look with special favor on Kimura and Lydia and grant them a rich measure of your spirit that they may grow in faith and godly living. Make us willing to carry out our responsibilities to those who have been baptized so that all of us may finally come to the blessed joys of heaven. Through Jesus our Lord. We continue our service with the singing of the next posted hymn. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you for coming up here. Girls, you did a wonderful job. Thank you very much. May God bless you. What did I say? We'll fix it. Thank you.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Question, quick one. When I say the word God, what's your first thought? Do you think of the one who is absolutely everywhere and fills the universe with his presence? Or, or maybe you think of the fact that, that God knows everything down to the, the very number of the hairs on the top of your head right now. And then if I asked a second question, how do those thoughts make you feel? You might say, Pastor, I love the thought that, that God is absolutely everywhere because that means he's with me wherever I go. And, and I appreciate the fact that God knows everything because that means that he knows exactly what I need as his child today. And, and if you thought those things and felt those things, you would be 100% biblical. But you know, biblically speaking, there's also a flip side to that coin. The fact that God is everywhere also means that he's behind every closet door and in every back seat on a Friday night. And the fact that God knows everything means he knows the sins of my youth and he knows the sins that I'd like to keep to myself. That's the biblical flip side. This morning, we come together to worship the God who sees all. Jesus is watching. Take comfort. He neither slumbers nor he sleeps as he watches. But Jesus is watching. Take warning. He's watching even when we don't want him to, and he's watching even those things that we don't think he has any business to be watching this morning, Jesus sits in the temple of Jerusalem watching as people give their gifts in the temple courts. That thought of Jesus sitting there in the temple as people give their offerings, why that downright offends our American right to privacy. But Jesus doesn't care about American rights of privacy. Instead, he pulls up a seat in the temple and he watches people as they give their wealth, which gives us the thought, should Jesus really be doing that? We've got questions. God's got an answer. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. It is surprising enough that Jesus would sit there right in the temple staring as people are giving their gifts. But friends, what is surprising times two at least is the day when Jesus is watching people's wealth. It was specifically, we know, a Tuesday. Tuesday of Holy Week. Three days later, Jesus was going to be dying on the cross, meaning this is now the two-minute warning and in the clock, it is ticking. Should Jesus really be sitting there watching people give their wealth? We're told Jesus sat down. But it wasn't because he needed a breather. There's a clue there in the original Greek language that says Jesus sat down, chose that seat deliberately so that he could stare and study as people were giving their gifts and that he did it for some time. For Lutherans who have been taught from knee high on up that you're supposed to be a little discreet when you put the envelope into the plate, that sort of offends our Lutheran sensitivities. So I ask you again, should Jesus really be watching our wealth? Let's think of it this way. If, if we were Jesus' ministry advisors, his cabinet, would we have suggested that he could spend his time better? How about this? You know, Jesus, you really should be watching for a place where you can celebrate the Lord's Supper with your disciples. Or, Jesus, you better watch your step because the Pharisees, you know, want to trip you up. Or, best yet, 
Jesus, watch your back, because Judas, he's planning on betraying you, you know. But Jesus, watch wealth? Yeah, you've got bigger fish to fry. But watch Jesus does. And what did he see? He saw many rich people throw in large amounts. That's, that's not surprising at all, is it? We would expect people who have been richly blessed to be giving big portions of those blessings. That's exactly what Jesus talked about earlier in his ministry when he said, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. That the rich and the famous were giving big gifts, that's not a surprise. But as you bore down into the Greek original, there is something surprising there. The, The thought is in the text that the big givers kept coming back again and again to give their gifts. In other words, there was a little pomp in a little show behind their gifts. It'd be like us today going, ooh, Mr. Usher, could you come back here and and pass the plate a second time? I, I forgot to give the other envelope today. Jesus sits and he watches. And as he watched, there was a person that no one else in the crowd was paying any attention to whatsoever. It was a, a poor widow A poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Again, nothing surprising. 1900 years before Social Security was invented, we would expect a widow to be poor and and that she gave two little teeny copper coins. That was the absolute bare minimum that was legal to give as an offering at the temple. That a poor woman would give the smallest offering, it is precisely what we would expect. But Jesus was watching that widow. And as he did, he saw something with the eyes of God that he simply had to call his disciples' attention to. Calling the disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. The woman that no one took notice of is the woman that Jesus took notice of. That she gave more than than all the others combined. You, You can almost picture the disciples sitting there, can't you? Scratching their heads, thinking, Jesus, this is a little bit of fuzzy math. We've We've witnessed people giving thousands of dollars to the temple and and just two little coins, clink, clink, that's more. To the eyes of man, this makes not an ounce of sense. To the eyes of God that sees the attitude behind the gift, it makes perfect sense. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. As Jesus watched the big givers of Jerusalem give their significant gifts, he recognized that they were simply giving some of the frosting off the top of the cake, that every single one of those people would go home to a warm house and a hot meal and a cozy bed and a refrigerator that was full. And then the next morning they would get up and they would put the thousands they had left to work and they would begin to replenish immediately the thousands that they had given away. Big gifts, precious little sacrifice. But that woman, that widow, she didn't give frosting off the cake because she didn't have a cake. As a matter of fact, she gave her daily bread money, her milk money, and in that small, small offering, 
<clears throat> she gave a sacrifice that all other sacrifices were a pittance in comparison. And at that moment that she gave those two copper coins away, giving everything, at that very moment she still retained everything. Because she still had her God and his precious promises and faith to believe them. Now, pretend that you were sitting there in Jesus' seat watching the widow give her gift. What, what would you advise her to do as her personal financial advisor? Oh, dearie, God knows you don't have it. Don't let the others give in your place. You know what? God, God knows your heart, and he knows that someday you're going to be good for it. So someday when you got it, then, then go ahead and, and give it. No, I know. You know, you know here's, here's two more copper coins. No, here's four. You go get yourself a Starbucks, dear. And do you notice that we would be very inclined to talk her out of giving the gift that Jesus commends her for on the very pages of the Holy Bible. Why is it, do you think, that we are so eager to make pious-sounding excuses to talk ourselves out of giving than giving each other pious-sounding reasons, genuine biblical reasons, to encourage each other in our generosity? I've got a hunch it's that deep down, every one of us wants to believe the devil's lie that giving is really a matter of the wallet. You notice Jesus doesn't talk a bit about that today. Two copper coins, thousands upon thousands of dollars, every gift in between, Jesus doesn't say a syllable about it. But Jesus has plenty to say about the attitude of the heart that is attached to the wallet the attitude of the heart that gives the gift. The challenge, I suppose, today is this. When is the last time that we have really given with the attitude that trusts our God? Two very practical examples for you. Most of us here this morning would, year after year, undoubtedly be giving thousands upon thousands of dollars to companies like Fidelity and Vanguard and Charles Schwab. And we give all of that money and we sacrifice that money thousands upon thousands every year with the hope that it's going to become more and more. But you know what? Charles Schwab doesn't make you a single promise. Have you ever heard something like this? Ready? Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Charles Schwab makes no promises. God does. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and that through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Why is it that we trust fidelity more than we do our Heavenly Father, and we view that as gain, but giving as a net loss. Jesus is watching. What is he seeing? Example two. You tell me, how much faith does it take to drive through a, a drive through fast food window and order yourself some Happy Meals for the kids, or... Or how much faith does it really take to pay the data plan on your phone bill? Or, or how much faith does it take to buy yourself a, a venti americano with steam cream every Friday? The answer, of course, is it doesn't take a lick of faith. Is it interesting at all that a majority of Christians in our land give more to their data plans than they invest in the work of Christ in his kingdom. Jesus is watching. What does he see? What he sees makes me wonder. 
Do you know we live in a land here in America where our average American Waukesha paper boy makes more money than 75% of families on the face of this earth? And even though our paper boys make more than three quarters of the people on the face of, of this planet, we'll tip our waitress 15% but that the average American gives 2.6% of income to all charity, not church, all charity combined. That will willingly give Citibank Visa 18.9%, but invest 2.6% in Christ and his kingdom. I asked the logical question this morning, do Americans so often feel broke because they are? or because really their attitudes towards their wallets are broke. The point is this. If we trust in our wealth, we're already broke. But if we trust in our Savior Jesus, you're already rich no matter what. Honestly, think about it. As, as Jesus commends this widow's gift, do you, do you think that Jesus let that widow go home and starve to death that night? Or that Jesus commends her to us on the pages of the Bible and, and then turned around and, and forgot all about her, thinking, you know what, I got bigger things to worry about this Holy Week. No, the woman sacrificed dearly because she knew that she worshipped a God who sacrifice dearly for the sake of her salvation. The big givers of Mark 12 sacrificed precious little. The woman, widow, her sacrifice was stunning. But it was the capital O-1 who sat watching, whose sacrifice was total. How dedicated, brothers and sisters, is Jesus to your salvation that he left literal streets paved with gold for the stinking animal manure in Bethlehem's barn? How much does he love you? How dedicated to your salvation is Jesus Christ as he lives each and every single day for you, perfectly for you in mind, that, that he himself battled against each and every temptation to lust after the things of this world, gladly living a life that he didn't even have a house to call a home or a pillow to plop his head on at night. How craving is Jesus for your saving that he gladly went all the way to the cross to sacrifice himself fully, completely, utterly for you, shedding not gold or silver or copper coins, but his holy precious blood for you and for your salvation. Rejoice, brothers and sisters, that the one who sits and watches in the temple is also the almighty God who saves. That the one who taught you to pray, give me this day my daily bread, has what it takes to serve up the bread for 5,000 starving stomachs using just a little boy's picnic lunch. That the one who walks on water and on the cross says, I thirst, is the very one who washes sins away through the bath of baptism and makes you into his sons and daughters, dearly loved. That the very one who says, Father, why have you forsaken me, is the one in same who will never ever leave you or forsake you. Should we trust a God like that? Praise God we trust a God like that. Which I pray, brothers and sisters, will lead us as a Trinity family to acts of boldness in the name of Jesus. Permit me in my final paragraph this morning to be very frank. When it comes to our Trinity family and our ministry, every now and then, is it possible that we give ourselves an out from being generous because we give ourselves the permission to think smaller than we ought? Are we going to fund the budget this year? Are we going to be able to pay down the repairs we made to the roof last fall? 
Are you going to be able to keep tuition to the point where maybe it raises just 50 bucks or $100 at school next year? All of that needs to be done. But if we are content to tip God every now and then, we will be wringing our hands over those things for the next 30 years, no doubt about it. But if we give like we trust God, a God who fulfills his each and every promise to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, might we give ourselves the permission to dream bigger gospel dreams, to quote Luther, to dare something for the sake of Christ. To dream of a day when our mortgages would be run through the shredder and the money going to Waukesha State Bank is, is money that is invested in the people of God and, and the people of our neighborhood. That, that Spanish outreach would become not a, a hobby of Trinity Lutheran Church, but a, a passionate plank in our ministry that together we'd be able to double down on working with our youth, the next generation, our teens, early childhood, our, our school, you name it, to dare something for the sake of Christ with the thought that just maybe it might still please the Lord to use you and me with all that we are to bring yet hundreds of people into a saving relationship with him to think this thought that maybe the church doors and the school doors will be the doors to heaven for someone. Dare we dream such dreams? Why not? It's God who promises, so generously, reap generously. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is watching wealth. He always has and always will. The thought before us then is, what will Jesus see in our day, in our age? A tip? God forbid. A generous heart that takes Jesus at his promises, God grant it. Because, brothers and sisters, your Jesus is a faithful Savior. You can trust him. No, you can take that to the bank. Amen. Please stand. And now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join our hearts together to sing the ancient hymn of the church, You Are God, where we praise you, O God.
You may be seated. Just two quick announcements this morning. I am pleased to tell you that our growth group enrollment for this fall's five-week session now stands at a little over 120. We do have a problem, however, that most of the nine households that are hosting uh, those social Bible studies that they're listed on the website is being full. So I am going to give you all permission to go home and cheat, okay? If you go to the website and you're a 40-something and you see that the 40-something Bible study is all full, go ahead and sign up for the 30-something Bible study. Not only will you continue to learn something and, and feed your faith on God's Word, but you'll also feel a little younger for five weeks. So full permission, if there's an open slot uh, go ahead and sign up for one of those. Those Bible studies begin tomorrow night, Monday evening. Finally, one from Pastor Ailhoffen regarding our campus ministry here at Carroll University. The campus Bible study or the campus ministry Bible study resumes this coming Thursday at 9 p.m. in the Ganfield Gym just down on the Carroll campus. You don't have to be a Carroll University student for that Bible study. If you know any college-age student, UW-Waukesha, Marquette, wherever they may be, if they're planning on being around this Sunday, get their name to Pastor Ailhoffen uh, at the end of the service here, and we'll be sure to get an invitation into their hands. Those are the announcements. May the Lord richly bless us now as we gather our gifts of love to the Lord this week. Hello, I'm Pastor Paul Prangy, a member of the Global Ministry Committee. It's inevitable that the neighborhoods around our churches change. That's always been true as different waves of immigrants came to America. Germans, Scandinavians, Poles, and more recently, Hmong, Africans, and Latinos. This creates great opportunities to share the gospel with new people groups. But the practical question is, where do we start? The members of Christ Lutheran Church saw their community changing as an increasing number of Latinos moved to this neighborhood, many looking for a new church home. To introduce themselves, the members of Christ Lutheran offered worship outside the church walls with this annual service in the street. We knew that before we could get them inside the doors of the church, if we could get them on the street next to the church and them get to know us, then we'd have a chance of being able to pastor to them, to be able to t teach them about Jesus. This service is part of a larger effort to reach the Latino residents of this neighborhood. Longtime members have found a range of ways to connect with their new neighbors, offering English classes, opening a food pantry, and encouraging Latino families to enroll their children in the church's elementary school. They recognize how important it is to make people of other cultures feel comfortable because they know that Jesus is for all, that Jesus transcends cultures and economics. Many more Wells congregations are in diverse cultural settings, so our Synod has created a toolkit providing a step-by-step -step plan for this special type of evangelism. The toolkit plan encourages church members to meet face-to-face -face with people to find out their specific needs. Having the means to be able to go out and really discover in your community what it is that is needed that's really, really big, really important thing. Once needs are identified, the toolkit then provides ways to connect church leaders with experienced synod mentors who can offer guidance for the specific cross-cultural opportunity. Amen. 
outreach can include fellowship events, classes, and foreign language worship services, among many others. But one thing every effort has in common, a willingness to reach out in love while addressing the needs of the people. In order for a congregation to be effective in cross-cultural ministry, we really have to come to grips with that, of being welcoming to people who talk differently, who dress differently, who eat differently, uh, whose customs are different. Um, we need to see them. You want to take a little bit off of that? Wells congregations have implemented the toolkit in a range of cultural settings, including Vietnamese, Korean, Chinese, Sudanese, and others. The only way that you can tell people about Jesus Christ, you have to show love to them first. Sharing the love of Christ is the first step. As a congregation's cross-cultural ministry matures, it may mean eventually calling a pastor who speaks the native language, a later step in the process. God has tremendously blessed the ministry with uh, many more numbers, and uh, we are able to develop the ministry in full scope to meet the needs of the Hmong people. Unlike any other country in history, America attracts people from all over the world. And that presents an opportunity to follow the Great Commission in our own backyards. The Cross-Cultural Toolkit comes from the Wells Joint Mission Council, which offers resources for both domestic and international settings. For more information, visit the Wells website for details. Will the new members of Trinity please come forward? Dear members of Trinity Lutheran Church, the people you see in front of you have desire to become members of our congregation because they've been baptized and instructed through our summer Bible information class. My dear brother and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus promises to confess before his Father in heaven those who faithfully confess him here on earth. You have come before this Christian congregation to declare your faith and to unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer the following questions which I, as a pastor of his church, will now ask you. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, then answer, I do. Do you believe that the teachings of Trinity Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know them through the Bible information classes, is true and faithful to the Word of God? If so, then answer, I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, to be regular in the use of God's word and sacraments, and to lead a godly life to death? If so, then promise, I do, and I ask God to help me. Finally, will you support with your prayers, your time, your talents, and your treasures, the work that, our, that the Lord has given to this congregation? If so, then answer, I will and I ask God to help me. Having heard your promises, we, the members of Trinity Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love and invite you to share in our worship and mission in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Barbara McGray. <laughs> Wrong hand. Your confirmation verse taken from the words of Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. Have I not commanded you? 
Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Welcome. You're welcome. Ronald Plager. Your confirmation verse, taken from the words of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Welcome. Jenna Clauser, your confirmation verse, taken from the words of Jesus in John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith, in mercy you joined this brother and these sisters in Christ to your church when they were born again of water and the Spirit. In mercy you taught them your saving truth. Grant that now, They may offer themselves as living sacrifices to you with us as their spiritual act of worship. Transform them by the renewing of their minds so they will not conform to the pattern of this world. Help us live in love and harmony with one another and work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Welcome to our congregation. May you be a blessing to us, and as we are blessings to you, go in peace. And please return to your seats. We continue our service in the bulletin with the prayer. Will the congregation please stand? We continue our service at the top of page 11. Let us pray. Mercifully grant, O Lord, that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. For without your help, we are unable to please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the spiritual and physical gifts you have lavished on us. And we pray for your guidance and strength to receive those gifts with gratitude and to, and to use them generously. Grant us hearts that find special joy in offering generous gifts that lead us and others to your heavenly treasures. Life is truly precious from the womb to the tomb. Please pour out your blessings upon tomorrow's choice banquet this weekend. Bless this ministry with resources to help the most vulner- vulnerable among us little children. Thank you also for the long life of Richard Grawl's father, Merlin. At the age of 101, you called him to yourself this past week. Comfort the Grawl family with the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. We also join Jim and Marge Hoover to give you thanks for 50 years of holy matrimony. In your wisdom, you join them as husband and wife, and by your grace, you have granted them this golden anniversary. Listen to their thankfulness for their blessed reunion with one another and continue to grant them rich blessings in their marriage. Finally, continue to pour out your blessings upon all our members who are engaged in the study of your word each week. Especially now, include those members who will be starting another five-week session of our growth group in home Bible classes. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and join together to pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever.
Let us praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.